So my research for the last number of years has been trying to build 3D printers that can create 4D objects, specifically for artificial muscles. And the idea is to create soft structures which can be implanted in the body, can act as replacements for valves or reinforcements for muscles, which are damaged, diseased, or have degraded function. So at the beginning of my research, I was talking to some surgeons, and they suggested perhaps I might like to work on contractile or peristaltic tubular artificial muscles. These are things that could perhaps aid somebody um, with incontinence who needed a new sphincter or in the soph if somebody had an esophagus problem. Um, also then talking with some cardiac surgeons, they suggested perhaps this would be a, a good method to create a, a replacement fully implanted pump which could aid the heart in case of cardiac disease. Something that uh, they already do with a balloon, they, they can put in beside the heart and it will inflate and deflate, but a balloon requires um, a tube through the, through the stomach or through the leg, and so the idea is to make a fully implantable electric version. So I liked this idea and I started to research how it could be done, and I realized one of the things that needed to be created was a, a 3D printer that could actually create these structures, and so this is where I really began, trying to make the printer to make the object. So just to, 3D printing itself, it's in the news a lot. Every week there's a new thing being made. There's a lot of hope and a lot of hype around it. Um, but it's really an exciting way of manufacturing. It, it grows objects from the ground up. It designs like nature does itself, using sparing materials while trying to maximize strength. There's lots of different ways to, um, to produce 3D printed objects. Sometimes they start with a, a resin, which they use a laser to harden. Other times, they, they take a plastic and squeeze it through a nozzle. And they melt the plastic and squeeze it through. And this in itself is an, an idea that's been around for a long time. You know, we've seen bakers do this and build up structures from the ground this way and using soft materials. But then also, in, there's traditional machining, which is where you're taking a solid block of very often metal, sometimes plastic, and using a drill and moving around and removing material. Now, this can create fantastic structures, but it's limited in other ways. Firstly, you're, there's a lot of wastage, but also you, can, you can't build internal structure in the object. It's all about surfaces. Um, and this has been around for a long time. Since the 1950s, really, we saw the beginning of computerization to control these machines. And, it's, and 3D printing still uses the same language that these machines used in the 1950s, with just building upon it. But the thing about 3D printing is you can make these fantastically complex objects. Um, natural, they look so natural and organic in many ways. In this case, we've got lots of um, jewelry objects and things that have been made for home decor, but they, they mirror the idea of lungs and viruses and things in these pictures and really beautiful geometries. Um, and also in the fashion industry, it's slightly more bizarre, but you know, you see these these wonderful um, clothing, these, these really crazy, zany objects that people are wearing, or could wear, at the moment just models. And at the bottom you see the printer that they actually make it on. And this is something that looks a little bit like a, a printer that you'd have at home, but you can get a sense of scale if you see the door in the background. Um, also, in the aerotech, or aerospace and heavy engineering, they're, they're starting to make metal objects by taking powders and shooting them with lasers and binding the powder together. And this is really good for making lighter weight, stronger structures, or as you see in the bottom, this, this kind of grid trellis structure, which is, couldn't be made in any other way. Now, the problem with 3D printing that they never really mention is, firstly, it's very expensive. And also, it's, it's slow, you know? Um, so, for this, it, it's more suited to bespoke, high value, low volume, pieces rather than trying to mass produce things. And no better a place for bespoke objects than 3D medical devices. Now this is where we're seeing things like jaw bones and um, vertebrae being tailored and implanted. Um, and also for, for objects, cosmetic and augmented objects such as the ear down the bottom which has a cochlear implant. And finally surgeons are, are finding a lot of use in taking CT or MRI scan data of a patient before an operation and using it to um, practice on before they actually go in. 
But the problem that I saw is all of these objects are hard, lifeless, stiff. And, you know, if you're trying to make implants for the body, well, human bodies are quite squishy for the most part. And, um, you know, apart from the bones, you, you don't want hard things pressing up against organs. So I started to look at how do you make objects which are soft, print objects which are soft, flexible, and able to move and actuate. So one of the kind of new forms of printing, a new term is 4D printing. And this is essentially 3D printing, but with an added dimension of time afterwards. And this is the object can, can move after it's been printed. And so really the, the printers are essentially the same, but it's all about the materials and how they react to a stimulus. This could be heat, it could be light, pH, humidity, or electricity. There's, there's multiple ways of making it react. And there's a lot of work done in MIT and Harvard on this. And some of my colleagues in ETH and Zurich also have created ways of aligning fibers as they're being printed with magnets. And it's, all, it's, it's really fabulous to watch these, these forms starting to move and come to life. So my side of 4D printing has been the idea of artificial muscles. And these are essentially rubber or elastomeric objects with different levels of stretch and tension, compression within them. Now you see the video there, um, this little black dot is kind of pulsing and growing like almost like a, a pupil in the eye. The way that it works is it's, it's taking a, a thin sheet of rubber and putting two conducting electrodes either side. And if you, if you charge up these electrodes or apply a voltage, like magnets, they're attracted to each other and they squash, the, they squash the piece of rubber in between them. And you can build up many, many, a big sandwich of this. Um, now the voltages required are quite high, but with certain processing, they, um, you can reduce it. Um, the thing about it though is it, they're called artificial muscles and termed dielectric elastomers, if you want to be technical, but um, they act like a, an anti-muscle. They grow as they're stimulated rather than compress. And so one of the things about these, these muscles is they, they really need to be stretched first. The piece of rubber needs tension in it to work well. Um, now, you see the, the video there, this little thing is kind of pulsing, it's twitching really. There's about 5% elongation, and that's because it's not stretched. When you stretch it, you get much, much more. And the, the reasons to stretch are twofold. One, um, something that everyone might be familiar with when you're trying to inflate a balloon, if you take the balloon and give it a good stretch first, then it's much easier to blow up. You're softening the rubber. Um, and the, the second reason is, well, a little more complex, but it's analogous to a, a bow and arrow, where you're taking a stretch string and you putting a huge amount of energy into it, and then attaching the bow, which is able to hold this amount, the tension. So then when you try and fire an arrow, you're only adding a little bit of extra energy and getting a huge amount. It's, it's an amplifier for the mechanical strain. And so this, I was studying in Nottingham, and I really loved the idea of this bow and arrow, you know? It, was, it seemed the right thing to research. So I, um, I started to look around and see, how, do, how does this work? Um, so I came across some work done in Harvard here, and this is um, using these kind of, again, bow and arrow analogy, stretched, um, stretched membranes with a, a frame that you can attach to it. And you make a flat frame and kind of build these structures up like a patchwork quilt. The problem with this is they were handmade and they weren't so predictable, so repeatable. It's, it's difficult to make something by hand like this, especially when the stretch is involved. That, um, you can be sure will always collapse in the same way and will repeat, and especially if you want to put these inside the body. They have to be repeatable. They have to be predictable. Um, so I kind of, I asked myself, you know, is there a way of making a 3D printer that's capable of stretching an object and imparting different compression and stretch and strain inside the object as it's going? And so I am, um, I began to make printers. I began to put them together. So first thing that I did was I took a, a spray gun and started to spray silicone. Um, now, I had to make very, very thin layers. These are well, 40 or 50 micrometers, which is about 1 25th of a millimeter. And in the bottom corner, you see a cross-section of these, these layers. There's, um, the white section is 
rubber and the black is these electrodes made of graphite in this case. Then, following that, I needed to find a way of inflating. And this, um, I realized, you know, or to stretch a balloon, um, especially if these are to be tubular structures. And I was talking to some friends, and they suggested, well, why don't you use this really old technique that they used to use in ceramics to make a body um, permeable to air? And so I tried it, and you see in the, the top left, there's a, um, an image of air being blown through this, this solid object into water, and you can kind of see the bubbles. Um, now, the, the choice of shape here was ex entirely arbitrary. I, you know, the idea is to eventually start working on MRI data or CT data and making patient-specific shapes. Um, and so anyway, I was able to build these, these structures, build these balloons, and you know, at the bottom you can see they can, they can come out in nice, interesting shapes. So if you've, whenever you've blown up a balloon, you, you can be sure they're never going to blow up the same shape each time. There's always going to be a slight deformity in the shape. And if you want to 3D print onto the surface of this balloon, um, you really have to measure it first. So I set about building a 3D scanner to start pinpointing where, using a laser, what size is this balloon, where are all the curves and everything. And so I came across problems with this. Of course, a balloon is partly transparent when it's in inflated, and you know, a laser, well, it, visible light tends to try to go through this. Um, and also things like the, the reflection is very shiny, and it's difficult for a, a laser to end up going all over the place. But I, <laughs> I finally managed to uh, figure out how to do it. And, I brought all this data into a CAD program and started coming up with these patterns to print over the surface. And the patterns were sp specifically to be a support lattice, a bit like an exoskeleton around the balloon to try and hold some of this tension. But I needed them to collapse down and grow. And so the, the type of uh, geometries, there's a specific name for them, which is auxetic. And this, these auxetic structures are able to collapse onto themselves without buckling in funny directions. They become nice and flat and smooth. So, after quite a while, I managed to get to start printing on these balloons. And um, this, this is really the most exciting time of my life, I feel. But um, it was, you know, I'm just sitting there watching all the time. Um, and eventually, these things, I, I print and build up layers and layers of this thing and um, let it harden. And eventually, you'd end up with um, these structures, which I suppose this was when I, I was really excited. Um, it actually worked, and I was like, oh, this is so good. Um, so this was kind of the first stage of where I got to. I was building the machines um, and able to make these structures. And there's, of course, still a lot of work to be done. Um, this was the first iteration of the, the printer that I built. Um, and I'm now working on new machines, trying to make it more accurate. Um, in terms of the making implantable devices, there's a lot of regulation behind this and hurdles that have to be overcome, particularly when you start involving batteries and voltages. You know, um, the, the medical regulators freak out a little bit. Um, <laughs> so really what I've kind of almost taken a step back and started to work on more passive devices. So these are things like valves or stents and things that don't require a voltage but require the same tension and things that are kind of called bistable. Um, but the hope is, you know, and there's many, many people researching this, um, that bio, bioengineered prosthetics either will become a, a bridge to full regenerative medicine. This is where they use stem cells and try to grow organs, but that's uh, quite a long way away still. Um, or maybe as an alternative to um, getting donors and having implants, um, you know, getting transplants, sorry, and um, using these implants and can kind of hopefully help a little bit that way. And so, thank you very much. <laughs>